questions. Thanks, Susan. This is really a great opportunity, actually, to talk to the library folks. And uh, I've, I've been thinking about this, actually, for a while, because we also have some project going on that may involve some expertise in the library science. And uh, I hope, actually, this talk is going to make us connected. And uh, initially, I'm not quite sure about what's the purpose of this presentation. So what I did, I just give a, give a picked uh, some slides I have from uh, talk about my lab and those kind of things. Then I, I thought it might be interesting actually to really uh, uh, dive down to, to, so I prepared two examples about projects we are doing related to Infomax algorithm in the text processing. So I hope that will give you some sense of what we are doing. So uh, very high level uh, slides about what we are doing. Basically, I'm doing two things. One is natural language processing. And we do both biomedical literature mining, and we also do clinical text. Currently, my maybe like a 70 percent I'm spending on clinical text, 30 percent on literature mining. And I so I thought that might be actually most interest to you guys. So all my two examples actually coming from this. One is on the literature what we are doing. The other is on the clinical notes what we're doing. And, uh, but I also spend quite a lot of time now actually doing data mining now. So using electronic health records, we are doing pharmacovigilance study. Basically, once a drug released to market, we're trying to find if there's a new adverse drug events, sort of monitoring. Then we're also doing, uh, mainly now I shift to doing drug repurposing. Instead of finding additional adverse drug events, we also want to see if there's additional benefits new indication that drug actually can contribute. So we're using electronic health record data. We're also using a lot of public data, like uh, uh, Susan mentioned. So we have uh, access to the school public health. They have a, a blue cross blue shield claim data for five years, the whole uh, uh, Texas uh, residents. And we're also getting CR Medicare data sort of thing. Then. For on the EHR side, we have our UT clinical data warehouse, which have about half a million patients. Then we also have uh, access to our collaborators, EHR, at Vanderbilt Medical Center. They have about 2 million patients. Mayo Clinic EHR, they have about 7 million patients. So we have kind of large number of those. Yeah, I spent a little bit more time on this because I'm not going to talk about this in, in the next few slides. So we are majorly founded. Uh, by NIH. I have a super grant, but we also have uh, NOM, uh, uh, National Library of Medicine grants. And there's also collaboration with the SBM faculties and also external collaborators. I think I can skip this. I, I, I just sort of give you a sense like what NLP is, but I don't think I need to actually repeat the sentence. So we also call it the computational linguistics. And here I, I'm giving an example just about all different aspects. I think you being librarian, you're very familiar with all the information retrieval, find the relevant articles, and those auto completion and spelling collection, and also doing translation. This Google is basically the representative for all the NLP work. So if you can, sentimental analysis and all those things, all those examples. And we're sort of uh, involved mostly on the information retrieval, doing entity recognition. And our colleagues, uh, Kevin, uh, uh, Trevor Cohen, he will talk about maybe information retrieval, which is a fine articles. And the two examples I'm giving you today is, uh, uh, one is what's called NAND entity recognition. You're trying to find a specific type of entity from text. For example, I'm trying to show you how we be able to find chemical names from literature and what are the issues and how you can use machine learning other uh, all the method to, 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 to find those. And that's so you can index the abstract, right? So the other one I'm talking about more uh, sort of methodology issues about what sense this ambiguation. So the ambiguity, like one word have multiple meanings, what exactly the meaning it is that's what we're doing. So chemical entity recognition, this is just some motivation why we want to do this. But if you look at uh, uh, currently for Medline, you're doing mesh indexing, trying to assign uh, 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 
turns, match turns to the article, and one issue is also about assigning chemical names. And a lot of, if you're familiar with the uh, biomedical literature, NER research, a lot of fo focus on gene protein, there's a dance of paper, but chemical names is kind of less explored, so that's why actually now there's a bunch of researchers interested doing this chemical name recognition, and they, they organized that challenge, actually. That's what we did, we participated in the challenge. And I'll just show you some categories defined by that uh, challenge about different chemical names. So there's a systematic name, like they use these IUPAC names. You probably couldn't see, but i just show you. There's also database identifiers, which also refer to chemical names, right? And there's also formula names, those big formulas, or brand name, generic name, and there's a lot of abbreviation too, or even uh, chemical families. So there's uh, like all those different, even for the same chemical name, actually you also have different ways to describe it, right? That as a first step right now, we are doing just recognize, say, hey, this is a chemical name, and it belongs to this category. But next step will be you really going to link, say, this is brand name, this is generic name, and it's actually all connected. And those can be solved by no existing knowledge bases, like uh, my colleagues today are going to talk about how ontology stuff that may actually can help. So basically, the task is if you're doing indexing, but this is more about annotation, someone will highlight all the chemical names two different categories I just described, right? So one abstract could have that many, all the different chemical names. And for us is how we can develop a system to tell me from this uh, token number two, this token number two is a chemical name and which category it is. So that's a task we are facing. And I'll just show you like how we can convert this to a machine learning problem. So there's a way, it's been there for a while, there's a BIO pr uh, presentation. So the whole idea is you want, need to determine the boundary of the phrase and know which category it is, right? So people come up with this representation. In this example, for this chemical phrase, they say the beginning of the token marked as B, all the intermediate marked as I, and all other outside of the boundary we marked as O. So now each token have a label, right? And we have uh, people manually annotated those, so then we can get this kind of annotated train sample for actually thousands of sentences. And now we actually learn from those training some built model. So what we do is we're trying to predict, given this sentence for each token, it should be O, it should be I, B. So that become a classification problem. Right? Basically, to predict each token, what's the label it should be. Either B, either I, either O. And what you use is uh, you use all the different features. You can use the word itself. You can use its POS tag. Part of speech tag is its noun, verb. Or you use words be before it or after it. So that's what we call the features. And uh, I talk about all different features. Is that a capital letter or a lowercase letter? So all those matters. I just threw it away. I, I don't think you need. And then you have machine learning algorithm actually help you how to build a model to be able to predict. So I just give a little bit like a how the performance wise. So in the challenge, they annotate the 3,500 3, abstract for training, develop another 3,500 and they annotate test set for 3,000 abstracts. And our performance in this event, so you have those two, you develop a new system, then you evaluate on the test set, which you didn't see the, don't have the label. So it's about like 89, it's actually pretty good. Basically the P position is a positive predict value. So if you predict 100, how many of them are correct? So that, that, that's how it means. Basically that means about 90% of that's uh, correct. So that, that's just one example give you how you can, and if you recognize those entities, basically like I say, it can help indexing. And it can also help uh, uh, information retrieval, find the articles, because uh, you can merge those synonyms actually, right? So you can help the search. So we do other things on the uh, literature too. We 
look a little bit about also name disambiguation merge too, because but that uh, turns out very challenging problem as well. Uh, so now I talk a little bit about clinical text, what we do. So I just give you an example of clinical text. Talking about patient with 70 year old man with the PMH for blah, blah, all those things. And you can obviously see this is very different from what the, maybe the news article you're reading. And the main problem is abbreviations, right? So <laughs> PT, patient, year old. Because that's how the, the way physician write. They want to save time, right? And but when we do NLP, actually we have problem to really recognize what the exact meaning is. And the most uh, challenging one is really about ambiguity. It's not just about recognizing this abbreviation, but if it's uh, just have one meaning, if you have a, a dictionary that's easy to expand. But a lot of the time they have multiple meanings. PT can be patient, physical therapy, or a prosorbent time essay, that kind of thing, so lab test. So you need, a, uh, then sometimes it's even, and because with English word, we see the word mom, they talk about mother, or they talk about milk of magnesium. So it's, <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of ambiguity in this. So I just have very simple slides to show, oh, sorry how one method we did to do the disambiguation. So we find this such summary notes, then we sort of trying to automatically it to, to create a pseudo annotated data set. What I mean is otherwise you have to have human to, to anno, annotate it, that's very costly. So what we do is, uh, yeah, we find the long term. If we see room air, we replace with I, then we say label this sentence, so the meaning is room air. So that's how we create that what we call pseudo-annotated corpus. Then from that, we train model. So for each sense, we have a profile. Then when a new instance come in, we compare the context with those uh, sense profiles. We calculate similarity. Then we decide which sense is the, uh, the, the correct one. All right, so basically I just show you how a uh, simple example show how we do this ambiguous, but there's also a lot of machine learning based models. So the final slide that I want to br bring up is also thinking about potential collaboration on grant proposal, that kind of thing. Recently, there's, a, there's a, this IFA actually brought us to attention. We are actually writing uh, IFA about this. I, I think a library actually could play a very important role in this IFA, because this is talking about developer NIH BD2K Data Discovery Index Consortium. So NIH have this idea. Now have papers, we have DOI, we know how to cite it. How about data set? And how we better manage all the data sets? So can we assign a digital ID to each data set? and uh, how we can promote people to share the data set, to uh, 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 cite the data set, and what's the incentive? If we say you publish this data and cited by so many people, can that affect your next grant, affect your tenure promotion, and all those things? And uh, how, once you have the data catalog, how you help users to find the data set, basically also like information retrieval, uh, trying to find the right data set might be used for your study. So, and I, this proposal is, uh, IFA is primary for to figure out what are the, all the potential issues if we propose such an infrastructure and uh, involve all different people, data producer, data use, users, library science, pe uh, librarians and uh, publishers, all together, funding agency, how we can actually study the, 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 the mechanism to, to, to build a data index. And uh, I think uh, later on the road, maybe we can talk about more about this kind of collaboration. All right, thanks. I think that's it for me.